Center in Leicester and waiting for an as live recording of the moon landing 50 years ago today, or to be more precise, tonight. probably seen the silver shiny looking suit. Our next speaker is Stephen Wisdom. He built that suit from the drawings from the British Interplanetary Society and he's also uh, coming in as uh, Buzz Aldrin. He's wearing a, a suit that looks very much in like 1961 when Kennedy stands up at Rice University and says let's go to the moon. Now when he says that America has got 15 minutes and 22 seconds flight experience. And that's his, you know, he stands up and says, can we do this? And people like James Webb at NASA say, yeah, okay. We're going to have to build stuff that's never been made before. We're going to have to invent new materials. We're going to have to make stuff that's just in people's imaginations at the moment. But people are inspired. Now we call this the tomato worm suit because a man called Russ Colley, who worked for B.H. Goodrich, he watched a tomato worm, that's a tomato caterpillar, and he watched it move round a 90 degree part of a leaf, it's basically turned a corner, by 90 degrees, and as he watched it take this right angle, its shape of its body didn't alter at all, because it was this concertina shape in its body. So all those little ridges that you see here around its body, all of those little ridges maintain the round body shape as it turns. And that's critical to do with spacesuit design. And that's why we always come back to the tomato worm spacesuit. Now, none of that is going to help us walk on the moon because of all that temperature problems. But once we've got the basic mobility, hopefully we should be able to make a suit for the moon. Let's go back to our Apollo suit and everything it's got. We've got a backpack. And that backpack has got his breathable oxygen in it. It's got his life support system in it. It's got his temperature control in it. It's got a golden visor over the top of the smoke perspex visor. And those are over the top of his bubble helmet. It's got his remote control unit on the front that he can control uh, his temperature and his attitude on the moon and the way he's moving around. He's got, as you see on his leg there, he can see those little bridges, those little ribs. And that is those uh, joints, those tomato worm joints, yet again. And he's got a cooling garment right against his skin, which I have to say, I wish I had. <laughs> and he's got urine collecting underwear. Very important, more of that in a little bit. So let's start on our Apollo astronaut from the head. He's wearing his communication cap. The com cap, the Snoopy cap. It's not just called Snoopy because it looks like the Schultz character. Snoopy was an unofficial mascot of the astronauts and they used Snoopy to, uh, to train them and to uh, give them a little cartoon character, which is why the McDonald's have got Happy Meal toys at the moment and the association with NASA. It's about the most historically accurate thing McDonald's have ever done to have an association with, uh, with Snoopy. So there's the, uh, the com cap, as they called it. It is dark brown, not black. Here, got the colour wrong, so my new ones are all made of dark brown, and that material is like a Teflon coated material. Everything on board Apollo 11 won't burn, apart from the fuel, obviously. Uh, Apollo 1 caught fire on the launch pad, killed Chaffee, Grissom, and White, and that's because they were in a pure oxygen atmosphere and there was material that burned on board. So after the Apollo 1 fire, everything is made not to burn. Jason Flores is on day. He's from the States. 
He's a NASA Solar System Ambassador. He's here to tell us about what the next steps are. We've been celebrating 50 years ago tonight, but of course, we're still exploring space. There's still a lot more to learn about the moon. We might want to use it as a stepping stone to Mars as well. So I'm really delighted that Jason is here to join us for this. He's also a clinical scientist in the US, and we're just lucky enough to have him for the summer uh, on this very special anniversary. So please give a warm welcome to Jason. So, right when I was about to purchase my tickets over to Europe, Space Policy Directive 1 came out, and that's when I basically knew I would change my talk. <laughs> the Trump administration challenged NASA at the end of March to build an innovative, sustainable program of exploration, leveraging our commercial partners and our international par partners, such as the ESA, and basically said, hey, NASA, you've done great work on the International Space Station, but it's time for us to leave low Earth orbit Let's get humans back to the moon. And let's let's plan for those those Mars missions like right now. So why go where we've boldly gone before? Well, we want to reestablish American leadership and American presence on the moon. We want to use the moon as a testing ground for the technologies, the breakthrough technologies that's going to be used for decades-long exploration from here on out. We want to inspire a new generation, get people really, really interested in exploration again, and encourage the young people in this audience to pursue STEM careers, science, technology, engineering, and math. What we're trying to do next year, or by the latest 2021, is to test the systems necessary for man return to the moon. So this is essentially launching Orion and the space launch system without any crew, and see how that works. And then, Artemis 2, we're actually going to put people aboard, send them around the moon, hopefully have a very safe splashdown. And then Artemis 3 by 2024 is when we want to have the humans actually return to the moon walking on the lunar south pole and hopefully we'll have the first American woman to walk on the moon. We want to know what's actually going to work on the Orion spacecraft, what's actually going to work with the space launch system, what do we have to tweak in order to go much, much further than, you know, a three to five day journey to the moon. So this is just essentially the timeline depicted graphically from 2019 to 2024, starting with Artemis 1, hopefully, as I mentioned next year, hopefully we'll, we'll test the, uh, the Orion capsule and the SLS backbone. Artemis 2 will be the first humans to the moon. They'll do a lunar flyby. Between Artemis 2 and Artemis 3, we're actually going to pay our commercial partners to send up the first pieces of the Lunar Gateway, essentially the propulsion parts of the Lunar Gateway, so that when we have the, the humans aboard Artemis 3 that are going to be the first ones to walk on the moon again, the, the Lunar Gateway will actually be self-assembled waiting for them, which is actually kind of cool. And then the bottom is essentially how uh, we're going to work with the commercial partners to pay them to deliver payloads onto the surface of the moon and beyond after 2024 establishing supplies and and, um, and playing an important part of the logistics of maintaining a moon base Floss got the better of us, so we decided to come along for a quick infusion of caffeine and we'll be in the planetarium watching the moon landing as live in the next hour. Oh, 
12.30 in the morning. We spent the last an hour and a quarter watching as live uh, the moon landing. So I think it's time for a little rest before a very English breakfast of bacon buns in a couple of hours time. Good morning from the National Space Center. On a very early Sunday morning, we survived Apollo Live with two hours sleep and a hard floor to sleep on. 